Okay, thank you all for coming. It's uh, pretty packed and I hope it doesn't get too uncomfortable. I haven't actually put these pieces together. So, um, looking, at, looking at some of the traditions and some of the specifics of some of the traditions. For example, some of the traditions that some of us are quite familiar with suggest our, our origins are very genesis with something to do with being naked in the forest, something to do with fruit, really specific stuff. Now, some people say these are metaphors, maybe, I don't know, but fascinating stuff anyway. Particularly when you look at the modern tradition of anthropology, primatology and so on, they're talking about our origins, tropical forests, it was warm, we were naked, and we had a specialist relationship with fruit. That's in the data, that's in the modern data. Fruit formed a relationship with many animals to get the seeds out there. Primates were one of them, and our physiology fits that picture very well. So again, two traditions telling a very similar story. Strange coincidence, maybe. The main difference is the ancient traditions, pretty much with one voice, suggested that a long time ago, something started to go amiss. We had this wonderful state of consciousness, this wonderful state of mind. We certainly didn't perceive ourselves as we do now and something happened. It's often tied in with some kind of ecological catastrophe and there's even quite specific information in some of these traditions. They talk about the emergence of a second self and that second self began to take control slowly but surely and it's the self that we now kind of identify as, as being human. And The self that used to predominate slowly slipped away and became very difficult to access. So are embedded with things we call today practices, teachings, techniques. I also suggested that you could strip away the belief, strip away the dogma, and look at them as treatments for a condition. And when you look at them like that, they start to tell you something about the essence of the condition itself. What were they trying to treat? Why did we need these treatments to access some kind of different state of mind that was perhaps better than what, cons what we consider normal now? I also looked in a little bit more detail at the sort of the modern approach, how we describe ourselves today in the scientific tradition, uh, looking at genetics, DNA, evolution, not popular with everybody, but nevertheless an interesting perspective. And the modern tradition I find fascinating. It's really talking about our DNA blueprint. It's responsible for building the structure, including our neural system, and that seems to have a lot to do with our behavior and our perception. I'm not saying they're one and the same, I'm not saying we are our brain, but something, uh, our brain is something to do with our perception, our behavior, etc. And it's pretty much responsible for everything we do. And what I was pointing out is, the modern tradition suggests, this is the code, builds a neural system, this runs the endocrine system, which pretty much reads the DNA code. You've got a kind of closed loop here. Anything entering the loop typically doesn't make a huge difference, unless it happens to be this kind of stuff. Today we call it fruit. It's actually the plant's equivalent of a mammalian uterus. It's full of hormonally active chemicals. It's kind of evolved to read the plant DNA thoroughly and build a whole new generation. It's kind of like its own, its own genesis machine, I would like to call it. Once you start forming a relationship with that, it massively alters our endocrine system and that impacts on the developmental environment. It changes everything. You end up with different developmental windows, different structure. And interestingly enough, the tropical forests are the one place where you get these really crazily big neural systems, very advanced neural architecture. They're pretty rare anywhere else, either in the fossil record or outside the tropical forests, with the exception possibly of the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins. So I'm saying the ancient traditions were talking about forest and fruit, something to do with our genesis. The modern scientific tradition seems to concur. Also, again, I mentioned these techniques, I'm calling them treatments, basically looking at all the approaches from yoga, from meditation, to the shamanic tradition, to music and dance. Why are these techniques necessary for us to start feeling better, start connecting with more compassion and empathy, and why are we stuck in this state of mind that really tends to lack these things as a species? What on earth's going on? These traditions talked about some kind of catastrophic failure, pretty harsh stuff. So today I'm going to look in more detail at the neurological data and the psychological data. And what I'm going to suggest is the modern data is actually telling us exactly what happened. Our interpretation is highly suspect. If there's something wrong with the perception equipment, it's a, it's a bit like having a mental health condition and self-assessing. Very dangerous. 
and I'm going to point to some of the most eminent researchers in various fields, and I'm going to say the date is great. The interpretation is highly suspect. Looked at some other clues, including some phys physical clues, handedness, obvious, a very obvious one, why on earth most of us, including myself, have a hand that just does not behave itself. It's not very useful, it doesn't do things very well. Why on earth would we have that? So really clues, and I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that they'll all come together, hopefully at the end, and make a coherent picture, and tell us something about where we are, and possibly how we can treat this condition more effectively. I also touched on, I, I talked a lot about psychology and perception, that's my main interest, but I didn't want to give the impression that these states that I think we've lost are simply about the kind of bunch of tripped out hippies sitting, sitting in the corner and they can't do anything. The very best of our physical states, the very best of our stamina and strength is correlated with altered states. The very best athletes, including some people here, talk about their best states coming out of altered states. Time stood still, they floated past the opposition. And really this is about the management system. It's not about the muscles, it's not about the training. If you have a very inefficient management system, nothing's going to work very well. But that's kind of what we accept as normal. If you can access something else, it's kind of in the martial arts tradition, the Zen tradition. It's really about training the mind. Once you, once you find a way to get the mind to change, everything else works. Reflex is phenomenally good. Strength, stamina, it all changes. Nothing to do with training. So a little bit more focus on the mind and the, the neural system that supports it. And really, um, I'm going to say modern science has made one catastrophic failure in judgment. Really, you never trust any of your equipment. You always test it, you always calibrate it. And it's kind of unspoken assumption that our neural system works. Nobody's ever asked whether it works. It's like, oh my God, we got this amazing piece of equipment, how does it work? Not does it work at all. The ancient traditions didn't assume that. They, they were very specific in saying something isn't working here, something isn't right. We're sliding into delusion. Delusion crops up in so many traditions. Of course, delusion, we all understand the concept. How do we know if we're deluded? Where are the reference points? I, I'm not deluded, but how do I know? Well, you start looking around and look at some of our species-wide behavior. Holy something. <laughs> There's some clues there that things aren't quite right. So I'm using this quote as a kind of coverall for many of the traditions. It's actually not an ancient quote. It's from a, a Hebrew scholar. But it kind, of, it, it kind of encapsulates the question that I'd like to get on the agenda. And nobody's asked this, as far as I'm aware. Not in a serious way, not in modern, modern academia. And modern academia, like it or not, has a massive influence on our Western culture and our politicians and everything else. So my hope is to slowly inf infiltrate the academic system with a question. Mm -hmm. Kind of dressed up as a Trojan horse. And I hope when it unravels, it causes a lot of interesting reactions. Really, is there something wrong with our neural system? Is it fine? Is it working okay? Well, that would be great. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot about left-right brain, and you've probably heard a lot of this kind of stuff before. And I'm going to say, a lot of it's really cool, but we've got it back to front. And in summary, all the consensus from all the studies is, humans typically, right across the board, are dominated perceptually by the left side of our brain. The degree of domination varies, some people more, some people less. But unless you're singing in prose all the time, you're left brain dominant. If you do this, what I'm doing now, speech, left brain. So if, if, you, if you like the idea of being right brain, cool, maybe you're less left brain. That's pretty much as far as it gets with the vast majority of people. And the challenge with that is, if our left brain's perceptually dominant, and it's highly advanced and specialized as the current thinking is, great. But the loop in all of this is inevitably the left hemisphere is deciding it's highly specialized and advanced. Now you see a problem there. If that's not the case, we're stuck in a loop. We're constantly looking in the mirror and going, aren't we so advanced, aren't we clever? I know a lot of people here obviously don't necessarily think that's the case, but as a culture, we're trapped in this kind of loop of looking at ourselves with a piece of equipment that might not be working. In fact, it might be badly broken. And the same, the same scientific data is pretty clear. Left hemisphere is in charge, 
perceptually at least, it does draw a lot of function from the right hemisphere, but our sense of self, the day-to-day -day sense of self that we think we are, very left hemisphere dominant. The right hemisphere does some weird things that we don't quite understand. It's kind of creative, it does some singing and art, it's got some cool abilities in the savant sort of syndrome where it's got phenomenal memory, phenomenal cognitive function, but it's kind of primitive and it's not really important anymore. So says the left hemisphere anyway. So this is just a little visual analogy, again, trying to highlight the problem that we may have. Trying to figure out what's going on. Obviously the lenses and the binoculars kind of represent the hemispheres. And how on earth you can see what's going on if the lenses aren't clean and working together. It's not possible. But you might think it's possible if you don't know any different. So it's a, bit like, it's a bit like if we've all got dementia, and I got dementia as well. And one day by accident I figure out, hey, I've got dementia. How on earth can I communicate that? How on earth would we figure out we've got dementia? Simply stating it, that I've got dementia or we've got dementia isn't going to cut it because the language doesn't work, the communication doesn't work. So how on earth do we figure out a way to communicate with ourselves and figure out what's going on? Okay. I, I'm happy for you to look at them later if that helps. Okay, yeah. And before I was saying, you know, I don't want to make the case that we are a brain, but I also, in juxtaposition with that, want to say that if our neural system is dysfunctional, the evidence is excellent. Tiny changes in our neural structure, tiny changes in the neurochemistry that operate our brain have a massive impact on our behavior individually and as a species. So if there's any problem in there, it's going to reflect everywhere. We're going to make insane choices and think they're okay. There's going to be all sorts of insanity going on and we're going to see, think it's normal. And I'm talking about our everyday lives, let alone what the bankers and politicians are up to. So again, Serious neural retardation, severe perceptual symptoms, pretty harsh stuff. Kind of what the ancient traditions were saying. If that were the case, what would things look like? I think they'd look kind of what they do look like today. Endless chains of madness, getting worse and worse with this stupid belief that things are getting better. I use the lyrics of this song just to highlight a, a, you know, a very simple idea of why on earth we need to imagine things will be better. We all want things to be better. It's what we'd all like. And yet it seems to be an incredibly rare thing to find where things are actually getting better and people are starting to get on. Most of our taxes go to pay defense contracts to build machines to kill each other, whether we like it or not. I mean, that's enough. I don't need to know anything else. There's a very serious problem going on here. Turning it the other way around, imagining that one side of our brain isn't working anything like as well as we'd like to think. It's actually damaged. It's got a serious problem. And it's in charge. <coughs> and because of the hormone regimes I was talking about, testosterone plays a big role in this condition. It's one of the causal factors. It actually gets converted to estradiol and it masculizes the brain. Because males produce more testosterone, this condition affects males more than females. It's not just a male thing, males and females both suffer, but males exhibit more extreme symptoms. So it might explain why the least functional people with the least empathy and the least compassion have the most fear and the most need for control. And where do they end up running things? That's a really, really bad idea. But please check all of this out, because I have a left brain, so I could be lying. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we touched on this, you know, uh, we're sold this idea that Western culture is advancing, it's wonderful in China, we've got everything we want. The reality is, when I speak to people, absolutely not. Stress, degenerative disease, confusion, nobody's really happy. 
and we're running around like you know like sort of hamsters in some kind of crazy mill that's going nowhere more clues uh, this is from the pharmaceutical industry again I'm talking about structure correlating with behavior neural structure correlating with behavior very close correlation tiny amounts of damage congenital damage changing the neurochemical regime massively changes their behavior every time guaranteed or your money back and the pharma pharmacological industries know this. They based a lot of their compounds on the ancient herbal traditions. The herbal traditions go back a long way. Why do we take these complex plant molecules and why do they change our behavior? Because tiny changes in the structure impact our behavior in the same way that if, uh, if you imagine our neural systems like a musical instrument, a phenomenally well-built violin, String tension, the choice of wood, even the choice of varnish have a massive impact on the sound. And if our sound is like a sense of self, they're not one and the same, but they're incredibly closely related. Then we touched on this, just an anomaly in this idea that everything's going really well. Endless wars in the last 5,000 years and beyond. And it's getting worse. And most of our best efforts drawn from the discoveries of a few people who access creativity and then they're transformed into killing machines. Remember this is a diagnosis. I don't want to suggest, I'm just here to tell you where it all went wrong. Once you have a clear diagnosis it's possible to then start treating it in an effective way and start accessing some amazing results. But you need to know where the problem is. So I've been touting this idea around for a little while now. It's taken me a while to put it together, and really it's an ancient idea. All I've done is try to translate it into the language of my own left hemisphere, which is pretty stupid. And lo and behold, it now seems to read well with other people who have left hemispheres. They can understand what I'm saying. And remember, serious neural retardation, particularly of the left hemisphere, and it's in charge. I'm not going to get very far with that unless there's masses of evidence in our behavior, in the neurological literature, in the anthropological literature, and that we have all these ancient traditions, weird coincidence, all saying something went seriously wrong, all these amazing treatments, and yet they said we kept sliding further and further into delusion. So I'm going to suggest, even at this early stage, and it's early, you know, it's early in its launch, and I don't put this up for ego reasons, at least that's what I'm going to kid myself. People from all walks of life, academics, new age psychedelic freaks, um, ex-police superintendents, evolutionary anthropologists, ecologists, I've run this by a lot of people. If our neural system is functional, hopefully you can spot this paradox, if our neural system is functional, I'm trying to sell an idea that it's severely dysfunctional. It shouldn't be possible to convince anybody at all with any common sense that our neural system's in deep trouble. Yet putting these pieces of information together and running it by a whole spectrum of people, the reaction's astounding. It's like, oh my God, this really makes sense. This is already a problem for people. There shouldn't be any support for this idea, but it's building all the while. I am going to suggest that having an accurate diagnosis gives us an awful lot of choice. Our neural system, its configuration, how we build it, how we design it even with the, the fruit and how that affects our development, how we feel it is entirely in our own hands. We can design it and build it from the very best materials, which it always was in the ancient past, or we can build it from garbage and it's not going to work. That's our choice. And it's pretty clear the current configuration does not work. It's getting us into dreadful trouble to the point where we're, it's, it's like self-harm, mental ill health. When it's mild, you're aware. You know you've got a problem. You might be able to try and do something about it. And I'd say our ancient ancestors knew they were in trouble. The records suggest they knew there was a problem. They were trying to do something about it. As the condition gets worse, like mental ill health, you get to a point where you don't even know you're ill anymore. It gets worse again self-harm. As a species, we're hurting ourselves very badly. And that's a classic symptom of severe mental ill health. 
So I'm going to go into a few more specifics now, and please check the data. This isn't something I've invented. This is something I've pulled out of the literature, and it's astounding once you ask a different question. Remember, the orthodox data is pretty clear. Left hemisphere is perceptually dominant, and its assessment of itself is it's highly specialized. It's evolved in recent times to do all these wonderful things like rational thinking, concepts, speech. Remember speech versus singing? Speech, the left hemisphere thinks, is more advanced than singing. Hey ho, I don't think so. <laughs> so these are some of the traits that are considered specialized adaptations of the left hemisphere. Self-deception. There's PhD papers written on why humans self-deceive. Now if you can't see a crazy conundrum in that, people spending time trying to figure out why we deceive ourselves. <laughs> Delusion. Masses of papers on how deluded humans are, how unable we are to perceive reality. Not one or two, masses and masses of papers, more of them emerging all the time. Anasignosia, it's a sort of, you know, it's a fancy term for inability to perceive how unwell you are. If you've got a serious condition, you're unaware of it. Left hemisphere, anasignosia. It's unable to be aware of how unwell it is. It's not that bad, is it? Confabulation. It's another fancy term. You may be familiar with it. Remember, these are specialized abilities of the left hemisphere, according to the left hemisphere. Confabulation. Anybody know what that means? What was the other one again? Anisognosia. Yeah. Uh, I'll go into it in a little bit more detail, so there will be another slide on it, but I'll just briefly go to confabulation. It lies to itself. It makes up stories, and it doesn't even know it's doing it. <laughs> it's in the literature. This is what the left hemisphere does, and it's in charge. Now, I'm worried immediately because there's left hemispheres flying 747s. There's left hemispheres running nuclear power stations. There's left hemispheres in charge of countries going, I know, we'll do this. That's really worrying. And it's in the orthodox literature. It's not in the kind of hippie newsletter of people who've taken too many drugs. It's in the orthodox neurological, psychological literature. And people think it's okay because they're deluded. It's in the same, it's in the same chapter. It's all in there. Oh, my God. <laughs> Specialized abilities. Well, I say special needs. And this isn't about blaming anybody. You know, if you've got a serious condition, it isn't anybody's fault. But we really need to wake up to what's going on. And the last thing we want is the least functional people making decisions on all our behalf. Not because they're evil people, because they're least functional. So a little bit more of a de definition of self-deception. Check it out. Specialized ability of the left hemisphere. Now, I never do this. I don't know if you do, but never. Tony, part of me wants to say this doesn't matter. It's okay. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and I certainly don't suffer from this either, but I know a lot of people do. <laughs> Specialized abilities, oh my god. <laughs> this wonderful closed loop of the, self, the left hemisphere assessing itself, writing the papers that feed down to the universities and colleges, we read it in popular magazines. Where's it all coming from? It's a little bit more on anisognosia. Great stuff in the split brain research. People with severe neural damage. And when the left hemisphere is assessing itself, it's upbeat and it's happy despite severe neurological trauma. You translate that into our general psychology, we're in deep, deep trouble as a lot of people are blithely unaware and think more of the same is going to fix it. Check it out. Have a look when you get a chance. And this is this certainly I never do. I don't know if anybody else here has ever 
deceive themselves or anybody else, but very rare, I think. And these are just a few examples. There's other stuff the left hemisphere that was really cool. Concepts, you know, we're sold the idea that concepts are an advanced form of thinking. Concepts are an approximation of reality. The left hemisphere can't perceive reality anymore. That's in the literature. And that's not worrying. It just has to make up ideas about what things are. Labels. We live in a world of labels. Take the labels away. We're human beings. We live on a planet. Now they're labels. We have no idea what this stuff is and what it's made from or anything. They're just a bunch of labels. And it's terrified of anything it's not familiar with. Familiarity is everything. The left hemisphere would rather hang on to what it knows and die than risk change because it's terrified. And that's what's running the show. So, back to some of the, um, the, the research. I've been in touch with a lot of people, not everybody on these slides, but certainly some of them. So I'm going to highlight some of the advanced thinking, the cutting edge of neurological research. Michael Gazaniga. I think this data is excellent, by the way. The data that's been generated, relatively objective. So you can look at the data. I mean, ultimately, the experiments are designed by a left hemisphere, but the data is quite interesting. Just be really wary of the conclusions. And he's one of the early pioneers. He was one of the guys that sort of postulated this idea that the left hemisphere is in charge perceptually. And I agree with him. He also like many other people in this field, agrees that the left hemisphere is deluded and confabulates. Unfortunately, I think somewhere along the way, he, like many other people, has forgotten he has a left hemisphere, conveniently. So he's done all this wonderful stuff, and he talks about these specialized traits, delusion, anisognosia, it lies, etc. And then, you see this on YouTube, he's talking about the left hemisphere, how wonderful it is, don't leave home without your left hemisphere. <laughs> What on earth is going on? This is one of the cutting edge researchers, 40 years in the field, never clocked he has a left hemisphere, and it surely applies to him as well. This is interesting. Um, again, academia usually pretty dry language, pretty rational, it would be. <clears throat> but some of these researchers, in their kind of comments on how the left hemisphere works, use very emotive language, which is quite rare. This guy was, it was looking into um, why Alzheimer's patients start developing artistic abilities, unusual abilities as the condition progresses. Now, typically, Alzheimer's and dementia, remember, the left hemisphere is already in trouble. Structurally, it's in trouble. It's already more degenerated. So it affects the left hemisphere more quickly. And it affects it to the point where its ability to stay in control starts to slip in much the way as many of these ancient traditions are trying to do. They're trying to inhibit the left hemisphere, loosen its grip a bit, and get access to something wonderful. So correlation in the very late stages of dementia and Alzheimer's. But anyway, looking at all this stuff, he came up with the idea that the left hemisphere is the bully part of the brain. Interesting stuff. Daryl Trefford, <coughs> considered to be one of the authorities on autistic savant syndrome people with significant challenges in their ability and function, particularly in what we consider normal ability and function, often speech is impaired or lost, yet phenomenal abilities elsewhere, usually artistic memory. Humans, I mean, this is another left hemisphere idea. We have two memories. We have a kind of working day-to-day -day memory, left hemisphere memory, then we have a Dedic memory where we can't forget anything even when we want to. Now, the left hemisphere is going, yes, yeah, specialized abilities here. Where do you think the Adidic memory lives? Right, right hemisphere. Phenomenal memory. So again, another academic, and he's looked at this stuff for a long time, and he's come to the conclusion that these amazing abilities aren't compensation, as people used to think. Oh, we've lost our speech, we compensate with singing. Mm. Oh, we've lost, we've lost some kind of abilities and then you get these phenomenal abilities in savant syndrome memory off the scale artistic ability all sorts of stuff so he's saying yeah it's it's when the tyranny of the left hemisphere is taken out of the way we get access to these abilities so i've been in touch with him quite a bit and again he goes on then to forget that he's got a left hemisphere and he talks about 
We are a left brain society, the left brain is served as well. Utter contradiction of his own research. What does he say when you touch base with him? Well, confabulation, denial, delusion. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not picking on anybody here. I'm just highlighting the condition real time with some of the most eminent researchers. You know, we've all got it. I've got it. You know, um, but yeah, it's, it's this kind of defense mechanisms come in. The correspondence tails off when the emails get more challenging. You know, it's like, hey, don't you realize you've got a left hemisphere? Not a reply for months, you know. <laughs> but that's what I'd expect. It's, it's uncomfortable, you know, it's, it's very uncomfortable to start accepting this might be real. It's great when it's somebody else. It's not so great when you look in the mirror. This guy, interesting approach. Um, he's considered a kind of genius maverick scientist. Uh, got involved in all sorts of stuff. Eventually got interested in left and right brain stuff. And he came to the interesting idea or interesting conclusion that, hmm, maybe some of these primitive abilities, remember primitive right hemisphere abilities, could be accessed if we can somehow dampen down the advanced left hemisphere. And he was aware that there was a piece of kit that, was, that had been developed, I think, for epilepsy diagnosis. It was a kind of fairly safe, relatively non-invasive way of switching off some of the, the neural system. So you thought, well, what happens if we switch off some of the left hemisphere? So, so those are some of the experiments he started about 10 years ago. I was, in, I was in touch with him while he was putting all this stuff together. Sure enough. Um, a lot of his subjects displayed enhanced abilities that are as associated with the right hemisphere. Of course, none of his subjects, going back to my first talk, none of, these, none of his subjects had a neural system built from the specifications that the primatologists, the anthropologists would say was our original specification. Right, so this is kind of going on in modern science with no context, and generally the presumption is the left hemisphere is here for a good reason, it's highly specialized. And sure enough, when you stimulate the right hemisphere, you start getting these kind of quasi-spiritual experiences. Still can't explain them, still don't know why they're locked in the right hemisphere, very limited. How many of these people who are considered experts in neurology and related, when I've been in touch with them, they have no idea about its original design, its original construction, its original fuel. Remember what I talked about the other day? incredibly complex, off the scale complex. It doesn't even occur to them when they're setting up these experiments. How does it work? At least Michael, he got in touch and he was immediately aware that something wasn't, you know, something was missing from the basic idea of how we approach this. He, he, he had never considered the biochemical information that the anthropologists would tell him were there, the pharmacologists would tell him were there. Very fragmented approach. It's called reductionism. It's considered a very good way of looking at data according to the left hemisphere. It's simply because the left hemisphere cannot cope with very much information. So we invent all these arbitrary disciplines, endless, endless disciplines. They're all invented. They don't really exist. There's no such thing as anthropology and neurology. There's this massively complex molecular ecology. And it's all interconnected and it's all the same thing. The ecologists kind of tell us that. It's another guy who's recently published a book. There's, there was a period, I think, from maybe the 80s onwards where the classic left-right brain, brain split was coming under a lot of criticism. A lot of people were saying it was far too simplistic. We're starting to get neurological imaging that's suggesting both hemispheres are engaged in both kind of tasks, which is absolutely correct. However, that tells us nothing about what kind of activity in each hemisphere is making it through to our perception particularly when we already know the left hemisphere is perceptually dominant. So activity in the right hemisphere doesn't mean the two things are contributing to our normal awareness. And he did a survey of all the liter literature and he's come out with this book, The Master and the Hemisphere. I highly recommend it if anybody's interested in the, the neurological data. Fantastic book. But, like everybody else, he seems to have forgotten he has a left hemisphere. And I have shown this slide and he has been at the talk when I've shown it, so, <laughs> and we didn't end up outside punching it up or anything. So. Uh, so yeah, he's talking about the left hemisphere being very dysfunctional, and he acknowledges the left hemisphere is dominant, therefore he must have one. And then he goes on, concerned as I am by the apparent neglect suffered by the right hemisphere and its version of the world, I don't myself take the view that the workings of the left hemisphere are intrinsically pathological. 
classic defense mechanism. <laughs> it applies to the left hemisphere, but not mine. <laughs> Strange. Highly recommend the book, though. The data is excellent. Really good data. Be wary of the conclusions, in my opinion. In, in my efforts to kind of solicit interest in this and get some critical response, I was trying to look for people who juggled more than one discipline. It tends to suggest more creativity, more lateral thinking. And I approached this guy, I think he's based in the States. Um, not only is he considered a kind of maverick neurologist, evolution, evolutionary sort of neurologist, he's also a primatologist. And not only that, he goes into the field and studies the primates. So I thought, great, somebody who can put these things together. Mm -hmm. And he is, you know, he's a, he's a pretty smart guy. And he immediately spotted that he'd never considered this. Basic design, basic specifications for constructing. And I'm using engineering terminology because it's language the left brain can understand. How do you build a thing? How do you design it? How do you build it? What do you run it on? Is it important? Uh, maybe. He at least figured out there was something missing from all the modern neurological research. Nobody's taken this into account. Why? Because the stuff's not there anymore and our neural system doesn't work very well anymore. So we're trying to figure out what the problem is with a piece of kit that just doesn't work. If we can give ourselves all these wonderful letters and dress up in suits, it doesn't make us any smarter. It's another kind of maverick neurologist. Um, I haven't managed to get in touch with him yet. Maybe he doesn't like what I'm saying, I don't know. <laughs> But I found his work interesting because, again, he's looked at split-brain research an awful lot. And he's, you know, he's totally in accord with all the classic traits of the left hemisphere, all the stuff I've said a few times now, delusion, denial, in particular, confabulation. He even equates the left hemisphere to the ego, which I think is interesting for an academic. You know, it's embedded in all the ancient traditions. It's talked about a lot of kind of spiritual language. And I think one of the quotes I like from his work is when something doesn't quite fit the script, however, you very rarely tear up the entire story and start from scratch. What you do instead is to deny or confabulate in order to make the information fit the bigger picture. That's what the left hemisphere does. It will not yield unless the evidence is overwhelming. It will figure out a way to stay with the status quo. It's terrified of change. You may have heard of this woman. She got a lot of publicity, mostly because she was an academic studying neuroanatomy and she had a kind of mystical experience. Interesting. If she wasn't a neuroanatomist, I doubt she'd have got all the publicity. But anyway, she did. I was in touch with her quite a bit. And basically, and in summary, you may have seen her stuff, she had a major structural failing in her left hemisphere. Almost killed her. Yeah, yeah. And what she accessed, with all due respect to her, yes, it was interesting. Yes, it was classic right hemisphere stuff. Yes, it was classic spiritual stuff. Not massively profound, not massively deep, but very interesting. But in order to access that, she had a structural failure in her left hemisphere that almost killed her. Okay, fair enough. Now, as, as, as her system's repaired somewhat and things have come back into some kind of equilibrium or what's considered equilibrium, she's taken the point of view that it's only enough to think about having these things and she finds my approach far too challenging. I should take a more positive attitude. It's enough to think positively and we're gonna have these kind of experiences. Well, that's very cool if it works, but she nearly died having her experience. Damage to her left brain was the way she got there. So I'm just going to throw that into the mix. Quite challenging, but that's the story. Life-threatening structural damage. Yeah, major stroke. You know, major stroke. Now, Ali G, what's Ali G doing here? It's a tenuous link, I know, but hey ho. Anyway, I've got to amuse myself somehow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen, I think he's a phenomenal student of human psychology. Yes. He understands how terrified we are and how making a few sounds that we call words terrifies the hell out of us if they're not the right words. And people get freaked out. Oh my god. 
But when you watch his stuff, you can see how frightened we are and how he can dance circles around people and create discomfort by what? By saying some words. And we're so locked into concepts, the left brain identifies itself with concepts and words. That's where the challenge is. If you say the wrong words, if we do the wrong things within those unspoken rules, people get terrified. Fear, mental ill health, they go hand in hand. His cousin, Simon Baron Cohen, is one of the foremost researchers in how testosterone affects neural development in the uterus. So there is a bit of a link. And what he's come up with, and it's not all his own, well, he's, he's come up with a lot of stuff. It goes back to the 70s. A lot of people have been working on this, looking at how our own hormones, remember I said in the first lecture, um, mammalian, the mammalian genome produces a class of hormones called steroids, testosterone and estrogens, and they play a massive role in reading the DNA, uh, regulating our developmental windows, like the age of puberty, which is the window where the brain grows, a whole bunch of stuff, really important stuff. And I was saying that all the cool stuff that allowed us to have these very long developmental windows and build a big brain was coming from the plants. So anyway, he's looking at testosterone in isolation as everybody's doing. And building on the research that other people did in the 70s and 80s, he's coming up with more and more evidence that testosterone plays a massive role in neural development. And particularly in the masculinization of the male brain. And that's considered normal, remember? levels of testosterone correlate with the degree of masculinization or another way of looking at it is the degree of retardation how much the, he the testosterone checks the development of the, the left hemisphere and in fact it even crops up in some of the literature the word retards neural cells in the left hemisphere interesting stuff if he'd gone along the corridor to primatology and pharmacology he'd find that the compounds that we know were part of a molecular ecology in the forest massively inhibit testosterone and its conversion to estradiol. For testosterone to get into the brain during, during early development, testosterone can't cross the, the, the blood-brain barrier, so it has to get converted to estradiol. And there's an enzyme, or a class of enzymes called aromatase, and they are necessary to make this conversion. The testosterone gets converted to estradiol, has a big impact on the developing brain. Flavonoids, remember that class of compounds I was talking about, very abundant in fruit? Masses of papers coming out on them every year, masses of functionality, they read the DNA, DNA, they do all sorts of stuff. They powerfully inhibit testosterone, they powerfully inhibit aromatase. It's part of the kind of pathology with estrogen dependent cancer. Our own estrogens now are causing cancer because the aromatase is now uninhibited. We're not eating enough flavonoids to prevent this conversion to estrogen and it's causing us damage. But specifically with the human brain, he's providing a lot of really good data on steroids, how steroids are effectively retarding, particularly our left hemisphere, and it's considered normal. Masculinization must be a good thing, specialist, adap specialist adaptation in humans. And in fact, he's saying there's a pretty simple correlation with testosterone and where men are on the autistic spectrum. And I don't mean in the most pathological sense, I mean generally. Men typically exhibit AS, uh, autistic spectrum disorder at some level. And that's due, due to our own hormones. Well, that wouldn't have mattered if we'd been in a symbiotic relationship and our host was flooding our system with protective chemicals allowing our brain to develop in a much radically different way, leading to different structure, different perception. I don't know if this is starting to make sense. These are big clues. Moving into a slightly different area, I think I touched on it, um, talking about the gut, human gut. It's kind of our first line of interface with what we eat. And Michael Gershon, single-handedly pretty much transformed our understanding of the, of the gut generally, and particularly the human gut, which is what I'm interested in. He realized bit by bit that the human gut is not just a tube that you shove stuff in and it digests it somehow. It's actually an incredibly advanced neural system. It's a tube of neural tissue. Your gut feeling? It's real. Highly suppressed now because of this, the garbage we put in and the fact the left hemisphere is in charge. It doesn't even understand how the gut works. 
check his stuff out. It's fantastic. And I did get in touch with him, and he, um, I was asking him about gut evolution. Because remember, symbiosis, we're not talking primate or human and the flowering plants, the trees. We're talking singular organism. So when they're locked together for millions of years, all the structure that emerges is entirely dependent on each other. It's a singular system. So our neural function, our physiology generally, is entirely dependent on this flood of chemicals from the plant. Take them away and it isn't going to work. And there's got to be clues. I'm particularly interested in our perception, our psychology, our neural system. But I also realize there must be clues elsewhere, and we'll touch on them in a little bit, hopefully. You know, our immune system, our fertility system, all hormonally sensitive, well, the gut also. And one of the puzzles is why there are so many receptors in the gut that don't seem to have any chemicals to log onto them anymore. And I basically said, well, you know, if our, if our ancient diet, it's the word I'm stuck with, it's really this advanced molecular cocktail, um, was rich in a whole class of compounds, including some of these chemicals, what effect would that have had? And he immediate, immediately acknowledged it would have had a massive impact on the evolution of our gut. Now, it's not my data. All he had to do was go along the corridor, the anthropologist, the primatologist, and they would have told him, yeah, this stuff was flooding through our system, and now it's not. So there's no way our gut's going to work properly without the biochemistry of fruit. It's an integral part of the functionality of our gut as well as our brain. So our gut's not going to work properly unless we've got this fruit chemistry there. Same with our brain. Singular organism. This is a little bit more specifically about fruits. So it should be a bit more interesting. Again, remember I was trying to contact people who were sort of multitasking, looking at different, uh, different disciplines. And Catherine Milton, um, she's been studying primates in the wild, looking at their diets, and she's even gone as far as analyzing the nutritional content, which is quite interesting. And it's then possible to extrapolate the kind of quantities of material that were flooding through our system 24-7 for millions of years. And it's quite shocking. Not so much what we, you know, what, what we eat now, but what went missing. So my initial correspondence with her, I was a little bit disappointed. Uh, you know, I was looking around for people who already knew this. I thought, you know, somebody's bound to have stumbled on this. Somebody must know what's going on. Um, my background's a little bit more plant sciences, a bit more botanical. So I had an idea of how complex fruit was, and it was a developmental environment, a sex organ. It wasn't just another piece of a plant. Something highly specialized, highly evolved, loaded with hormonally active chemistry, loaded with materials to build a whole new generation. So one of my first emails, whether in 2000, part of a response was, isn't fruit mostly sugar and water? Uh-oh, this isn't going to go very well. <laughs> but I persisted anyway, and we had some correspondence. And the papers are online. She has them online on her website. I've got some of them online in my, on my website, and I incorporate some of it into the book. Looking at her studies and looking at what your typical primate eats, and translating that into the molecular profiles, the hormones, the flavonoids, the antioxidants, and so on and so forth, we've lost a minimum of 95% of the most complex molecular ecology cocktail ever. That's gone in the typical human species now. 95%, and I'm being conservative. I don't want somebody coming along and saying, it's 94%, your whole theory's wrong. It's, <laughs> it's actually closer to 98%, and that's in people who eat reasonably healthily. I mean, here you might find some people where that doesn't apply, where it's, you know, it's dropped a lot, but you're looking at people who eat a lot of fruit. And remember, it's not just food. It's the design compounds that read the DNA. It's the antioxidants. You know, you've heard of vitamin C, vitamin E. Flavonoids are very powerful antioxidants. And the neural system, our, our neural system's made of fatty acids, volatile fatty acids. They oxidize extremely easily. In nature, they're always wrapped in these antioxidant chemicals because they will damage really, really easily. We can't make them. The only place we can get them is outside ourselves. And most of us are chronically deficient in essential fatty acids as a species. And even where we do come across them, we strip them out of their protection. And what, would you, what do we do? Heat them in oxygen at really high temperatures. So it's like taking pristine steel, putting it in salty water, that's a pile of rust, 
and then building a neural system from it. Highly oxidized. We can't do any repairs to them. They're damaged. We build a neural system from them. And then there's nothing in our system to protect that neural system, so it starts rusting. Is any wonder we've got an increasing epidemic of dementia and mental ill health? Our neural system is incredibly delicate, and it was flooded with highly protective compounds, thousands of them, by the kilo, all gone. And that's what's running the show now. I'm a little bit worried by that, but... Oh, what else have we got? Yeah, just another little summary. Yeah, same, back to, the, back to the, the plant cocktail. It's not just design, it's not just construction, it's not just protection. But fruit, you know, there's a, there's a lot of propaganda about drugs. People have a lot of issue with drugs, understandably so, because humans do a lot of stupid things with refined chemicals. But fruit is full of drugs, full of neuroactive compounds. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, all sorts of classes of neuroactive compounds. And if our neural system evolved in that cocktail, then its operating system, the neurochemistry, was coming from the fruit, or a big chunk of it. Most of the studies are done now are what our own genome produces, the kind of dopamines and the, the things you've heard of, the serotonin. Sure, they're part of a primitive neural system. The really cool stuff was coming from the plants. And again, that's all gone. So the idea our neural system can even begin to function is a joke. It's not going to work. It's had all the really cool stuff stripped away. It's going to be running like a very primitive neural system, running on fear, limited perception, limited abilities. I don't know if anybody spotted that, but that's what seems to be going on. So it's a, it's a grand claim to make, but it's a very ancient claim. It's in all the ancient traditions. If our perceptual equipment isn't working, we're stuffed. Turning that around though, looking at all the symptoms we've created, which are becoming increasingly overwhelming, I'd rather face the prospect of dealing, something, dealing on something at a human scale. If our neural system's not working, can we fix it? Well, we already know a huge amount about how to fix it, or at least start fixing it. We know all these traditions give us a lot of clues. We know how to build it better. We know how to build it from really good quality material. We can take massive steps within a very short time to start repairing it and start getting some really cool functionality back. It's a choice we can make starting today. So this is just going back to what I was saying earlier. If there's a problem with our perceptual equipment, we should be very, very wary of self-assessment. Look in the mirror, I feel great today. Well, maybe, that's cool. But if there's a, if there's a suspicion our self-assessment equipment is damaged, we should be looking at objective data, looking at our behavior as a species, looking at the neurological data, the psychological data, looking at these ancient diaries of our descent into madness. What are they telling us? Do they say, yeah, there's a few people got a bit of a problem? No, they say, species-wide, we were sliding into delusion, becoming more primitive and animalistic. No exceptions. And that was thousands of years ago, and it's been getting worse. But once you start factoring this in, it starts making sense. And I'd suggest it's actually quite exciting. It's like, wow, this might be fixable, and it might be fixable in quite a short time. But it explains why, as a species, we're increasingly unaware of the depth of trouble we're in, and why we continue to make completely insane choices time and time again while spouting the same old rubbish about how wonderful everything is and we're getting more advanced. <clears throat> I've got a question. I'd rather take questions at the end if that's okay. I'm going to touch on this a little bit, um, a little bit controversial maybe for some people. Um, it just highlights the potential of changing the molecular structure and getting a radically different result. PhD's done in this now. Um, and it ties in with the ancient traditions. Very judicious use of chemicals that can help access a little bit more function in the neural system. And something that touched a lot of people, uh, rave culture, late 80s, early 90s, single chemical. Now, I'm not for a minute saying we're deficient in MDMA or ecstasy or anything like that. However, 
Anybody ever take that? Anybody want to dare own up to that? Right, single molecule, what kind of effect did it have? Profound. Okay, single molecule could turn people who were fighting at football matches one week, hugging each other on the dance floor the next. Okay? Sectarian violence in Northern Ireland, religiously motivated. Same kinds of studies have been done. People who are out to kill each other, take some of this stuff, within weeks, friends for life, all loved up. Now, I'm not saying this is a solution, absolutely not. What I'm saying is a massive, massive cocktail of chemistry went missing. These are really crude analogues, but they give us a clue as to what's possible. If we start putting some of this missing biochemistry back, it's possible to transform our behavior very quickly. Are you saying they're healthy? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not making any comment other than saying, change the structure a little bit and you get a massive effect. That's all I'm saying. But yes, I mean, some of them could be. <laughs> like I said, I never confabulate, so. <laughs> So just to sort of start tidying this up a little bit, and I know it's a lot of information, I'm not expecting all of this to come together perfectly for everybody. There's websites, there's a book, it takes a while for all this to come together, but at its core it's quite simple. So I just want to finish looking a little bit more at what I would call a kind of biological parents, the forest, and really what was going on here. And most of us grown up with the terms of diet, nutrition and so on. Starting with a typical, very basic flower. It's actually the plant's sex organ, and it's kind of touting for business. Plants have made relationships with insects and all sorts of animals, kind of lured them into all sorts of relationships with sweet treats. Humans still do it today, you know, sweet treats, flowers, sexual agenda, still goes on. And what we have here, we've got ovary, ovule, this is the plant's sex organ, equivalent of the mammalian uterus. And when it starts forming a relationship with um, the primates, the sex organ swells, it colors up, it's like, come and get me, it's quite sexy stuff. And of course, the sex organ is full of hormones, or hormonally active compounds. You start ingesting them, massive impact. It's all real stuff, I didn't make this up. This is a kind of botanical description of the plant's sex organ. And this is the stuff we should be eating. It's kind of oral sex with plants. Really cool stuff. So next time your friends are giving you a hard time about what you're eating, you can tell them a different story. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a few pictures from my own kind of porn collection. <laughs> just really demonstrates the phenomenal structure, phenomenal complexity. The colors are all active compounds, and that's the stuff that designed and built our brain. And without this stuff, we're on a downhill slope to somewhere not very pleasant. Now, this is what we formed a relationship with, the, the sex organ of the plants. And remember, the plants are competing for business. They're kind of like standing on the street corners, the ones with the biggest <laughs> organs, the most color, that taste good and make us feel good. They're the ones we're going to eat. The seeds from those are going to they're going to proliferate, so they're in competition. So it allows for fast track evolution, but it's not coming from our genome; it's coming from the plants. Look at this stuff, crazy stuff. Talk about advanced technology. Ooh, <laughs> I know, scary stuff, isn't it? It should be on late at night, really, I know. Yeah. <laughs> this rated R? Yeah. Probably a little bit more than R, I think. But. So, just to summarize, okay, this is a South American fruit, I think, it's Passiflora. Remember, this is, this is the equivalent of the plant's uterus. These are the seeds, and the, the cocktail of compounds in here is getting the plant's DNA read in such a way that it's building a whole new generation, and the construction materials are, materials are arriving to build it. What in effect happens when you form a relationship? Now I say in effect, it takes a little bit of lateral thinking. What really happens if you're flooding your system 24 seven with this stuff? This is really what happened. This is where our genesis lies. This is where our evolution lies. It's in the developmental environments of the plants. Infusing our own system,
flooding our own system with the transcription environment of a totally different kingdom as we currently describe it. It's going to come up with something pretty radically different. It's going to come up with some, something pretty unus unusual and unique. And the only place this can go on is in the non-seasonal tropics. The only place you can get fruit 24-7 for millions of years, not in the high latitudes, not even in the tropical seasonal forests, non-seasonal forests, very narrow band. It's wet, it's warm all the time, and there's fruit available all the time. And there's very few, pred there's very few predators there because there's no grass, there's no big herds of animals to eat. So it's a very, very benign environment. And it allows all kinds of strange experiments to emerge where, where competition isn't the prevailing factor. So that's what our brain was bathed in as it was developing And in fact, during our development, including breastfeeding, because breastfeeding, breast milk's based on what we eat. So we're eating high fruit diet, breast milk's going to reflect that. It's going to be full of these same compounds. And in fact, we never left symbiosis. We were in a perpetually symbiotic relationship all our lives. So really, you've got these wonderful you know, these kind of wonderful um, trees and they're sort of protecting us, feeding us. It's a bit, you know, it's a bit sexy. They're feeding us with us, their sex organs, but they're loaded with these chemists, this chemistry that's wonderful to build a perception, a, a perceptual equipment that's phenomenally different. And really, instead of thinking humans evolved a big brain, it's really the forests that did it. They hijacked a primitive mammal, re-engineered the genes and turned it into something amazing. Break that, and we end up with a mammalian DNA doing what it always did, trying to build an efficient neural... It's not got any compassion, it's not got any empathy. It fights, it competes, it's hierarchical. That's the direction we're heading in. So there's a very real trail here. And effectively, we really are children of the forest in the most literal sense. Okay, thank you very much. So whether other primates have a left brain and right brain? Yes, there's some evidence. Um, I mean, part of my proposal, and there's a lot of pieces to it, is pretty much all the apes and primates have all gone through this window. We may, due to our physiology, the, the, the later hominids, particularly humans, may have been the very last of the symbiotic union to break that union. So the chimpanzees and the apes probably left that symbiotic union a long time ago. It doesn't mean that they, didn't live, they don't live in the forest now, but the, the separation occurred a long time ago, and they're on the same path of slowly reverting to time. And there is some evidence of left-right asymmetry. It's not as strong as it is in humans. I think um, the bigger you build this neural system, the more susceptible it is to a crash, basically. It amplifies the degeneration. You know, we get, we get a much more asymmetric response when we lose all this chemistry. When our neural system's grown this big, the fall is really hard. So there's, there's some naturalized function in the system. I would like to hear the Q&A down here. No, that's, that's part of it. Uh, so a little bit, but nothing like is extreme. So, so you're saying that they do function off of their left brain more than their right, as we do? To some degree, right. but nothing like as much. Gotcha. Yeah, nothing Thank like you. as much. So, from a from a diet and food standpoint, what I think I'm hearing you say is that out of the two evils, fruit or standard American diet, fruit's better. Yes. Um, in, in terms of diet, uh, the question's about you know whether a standard American diet or fruit. I mean, yeah, fruit wins hands down. What I don't say, in you know, uh, I'm at a fruit festival. I don't say putting fruit back on its own is enough at this stage. There's a there's a kind of complicated sequence of events to un to unravel now. And in fact, by definition, if we were a sim symbiont organism 200,000 years ago, now we are not. So we're not highly specialized fruit eaters anymore. 
part of that needs to be rebuilt partly through diet it's kind of reawakening our systems through diet so switching to fruit 100 percent fruit it might work for some people i always advise a little bit more caution but yes fruit would be better than a standard american diet every time you know whatever problems that might occur i mean that's devastatingly damaging absolutely so you said we're only getting five percent of what our ancestors got at best, from, at, from best fruit. Uh, at best at in, best in a standard diet yes that's very that optimistic from fruit no, no if, if you're eating a lot of fruit, then um, you can start upping that percentage. I mean, the fruit's not the same. The fruit that, the fruit that must have formed these special alliances with the biochemical selective pressures is probably in Africa if it still exists, and there's not much commercial exploitation of fruit. However, fruit has a lot of generic biochemistry, so fruit, even from the high latitudes, is going to have some of the chemistry, a lot of beneficial chemistry. So, yeah, eating a lot of fruit, we can start putting that percentage back but it's like putting highly specialized rocket fuel into a tired old car. We need to rebuild the car first. So there's always a risk you're going to do some damage by putting this high octane fuel in. How would you rebuild it with nothing to eat? It's, it's a bootstrapping effect. You start off kind of reversing the process as best you can. I, you know, I tend to sort of think there's a lot of weight in the ancient traditions. They talk about greens for healing, fruits for food. Well, we're in such a mess, I'd say always start with a high percentage of greens and slowly work towards the fruit and begin incorporating the techniques and treatments that can start shifting to the management system that's better able to handle the fruit. Because remember, the left brain isn't the fruit eater. It's more primitive now. So it's going to struggle with this highly complex cocktail. So it's, but you can kind of do it in a bootstrapping effect. Improve your diet, engage in techniques that start shifting the, the balance of your hemispheres, improve your diet, and slowly begin building it up. It's going to take a little while. Yep. Isn't one of the techniques the ancients prescribed to actually engage in fasting for that reason? Because it actually breaks down the tissues you don't need it and allows the body to, to cannibalize those and rebuild. So in a sense, maybe have you thought about, like as I read a, some time ago, the Science and Fine Art of Fasting by Herbert Shelton, it was talking about all the scientific studies that were done on that. And it was interesting that they were even showing that some of the cells go into they, they de-differentiate and go into the embryonic state. Mm -hmm. and so you could almost, you could almost do, through applying fasting followed by eating all the fruit, you could almost do that deconstruction of what isn't necessary and what is not part of what we should be, and then maybe start sure, re I'm, rebuilding. I'm not an expert on fasting, although I'm interested in it. I've done a little bit of juice fasting and so on years ago. Um, I mean, I think there's several reasons why it could be helpful. I mean, anything to get the garbage out that's normally in there, including in our neuro gut axis you know that's part of our perceptual equipment much more than we realize beyond that yes there may be benefits however i i haven't seen any evidence how that would begin reversing cerebral dominance there's a there's a kind of big limiting factor in our neural system so we can begin making some changes and fasting may help like i say i'm not an expert on that um but once we've started in, incorporating some of these missing um groups of chemicals cleaned out some of the garbage it's then trying to raise the glass ceiling with this cerebral balance, and that's where all these techniques start coming in. So I think starting to use them together, again, it's a, it's a sort of ratchet effect. Improve this, improve that. Try and do too much at once. You might get away with it. You might run into trouble. But fasting, yeah, I think fasting is a very ancient tradition. I'm sure it's got some benefits, but I don't know enough about it to really comment. Okay. Any more? Yeah? Um, when you go on a, a, a raw food diet, well sleep's a whole interesting area and I could probably talk for an hour on that at least but uh, generally as far as I'm concerned where we get the most benefit neurologically from raw food diet moving towards food is less in the left, less in our normal state of self. That's kind of limited by these design problems. You know, the left hemisphere is design limited. It's now quite a primitive design. And that's going to be quite difficult to change, but it's potentiating this more advanced structure we have in the right hemisphere. Because most of us, we've grown up, we've built our neural system from rubbish. And although there's great potential in the right hemisphere, it's still not going to work very well if it's built from garbage and it's fueled from garbage. So you start shifting your dietary inputs, this molecular input, and you're potentiating the right hemisphere. And that will bleed through a bit. You will start feeling better. Things will start working better. 
you might dream a lot more. It's sort of waking up a little bit, but it's still locked in the basement. So really, it's a kind of potentiating effect. Then when you start engaging these treatments, meditation, yoga, or anything else you want to start working with, that's when you really start seeing the benefits. I don't think it's enough just to eat a raw diet, a fruit diet. It will make some improvements, but there's still a glass ceiling there. Like I say, if you're still doing what I'm doing now, if you're still using speech in that normal way, you're still in your left hemisphere, and it cannot fully utilize these things anymore. How can you trust any of the data you're doing if it's done from the left side? It's a good question, and, and I, I ultimately say be cautious, but it's the nearest we've got to objective data. I think it's a lot more objective than our opinion or our interpretation. You know, the, the experiments produce results. Yeah, take it or leave it, but I'd say it's more objective than somebody's opinion. Uh, and some of the results keep cropping up time and time again. If you do this, the left hemisphere does that. Well, it looks like it does that then. But yeah, it's a good point. And I don't think any of it's to be relied on totally. But when you look at the whole picture and it all starts saying similar things, then I think it's a lot safer. You know, when the ancient traditions are talking about sliding into delusion, then these papers are coming out saying the left hemisphere is deluded. It's interesting at least. But it's, you know, it's, it, I, I'd say it's when you see the whole context, it looks more powerful. Any individual piece of the jigsaw, for sure, be cautious. But when you put the whole thing together, it starts to look like it makes some sense. Um, and at the very least, I think it's worth checking out. I mean, maybe it's something completely different, but it's worth checking out, I think. Yeah. Um, in your last lecture, you said that uh, rice and corn, foods like that, were, were bird food. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you implied the power, or like mice food or something like that. Do you mean that did you uh, imply, mean to imply that they minimize the potential of, of our brains? And also, um, you're talking about eating a, a fruits and vegetable diet, a raw food diet, um, you know, making positive effects on the on our ability to um, use the right side of our brain, but mm -hmm. there still be a, a glass ceiling. Yeah. How do how do we break above that glass ceiling, or is that something that you, you still continue to work on yourself? For sure. Yeah, I, I'm I'm afflicted with this condition as well. I mean, I'm still you know I'm still fascinated by it and trying to work with it in different techniques. Um, you know, as I say, I think it afflicts the whole of humanity. So it's it's a pretty serious condition. But those traditions, I think, give us a lot of clues. And there's even clues coming out of the modern neurology how we might be able to move this forward quite quickly. But I mean, I think you asked me two questions. One on the seed. I mean, I highlighted that that you know we we've gone from building our system from this incredibly complex molecular environment, we've ended up as a species predominantly using grass seed. The rice, the corn, uh, the wheat, the barley, the oats, they're grass seed. And they're highly, they're, I, I'd say way more extreme than that. Seeds generally don't want to be eaten. They're highly defended. They've got all sorts of, you know, defensive chemicals in there. And nutritionally, they're very different. Remember that the fruit is a response to a symbiotic relationship. So the swelling of this organ, with all this complex biochemistry, it wants to be eaten. It's like, come and take me away, disseminate so that the seeds. Like, that includes like almonds and like uh, sunflower seeds and things like that. To some degree, I mean, to some degree there are defense mechanisms in there. Some fruit have a kind of numbers game where it's, you know, the, the seeds are edible and they're quite nutritious. Uh, the idea is that some of the seeds will always get through. Figs are a good example. You know, the, the, the seeds of figs are edible, they're highly nutritious but they're quite small, so you eat the fruit, you eat the seeds, you crunch some of the seeds. It doesn't need many to get through for it to be an efficient system, but a lot of seeds don't want to be eaten. You know, so it's seeds be cautious with. Some you can, you know, you can soak, you can do some things with. And then back to the glass ceiling, it's what I was saying before, it's starting to apply techniques or treatments, as I call them, to shift the dominance a little bit, to begin accessing a more efficient assimilation system, a, a more efficient perception, it's not going to happen overnight for most people. In fact, that's very rare. What are those things outside of eating fruits and vegetables? Um, well, that's kind of like the, the basic engineering rebuild. Then you're looking at the treatments. So I say meditation, yoga. Um, it, it, could be, uh, it could be sort of some of the shamanic tradition. Anything that's about trying to shift your state of consciousness. Of course, approach it carefully and, you know, judiciously. I, I was remembering that uh, they say that the ascension methods by the left left hemisphere had to do with the uh, expressing rationality of logical fasting and uh, uh, the right perception. Yeah. The right ascension methods have to do with uh, appreciation, gratitude, love, so many sides. Yeah. Compassion, empathy, forgiveness, mercy. So those kind of 
practices that actually involve that kind of emotion? Yeah, I, I, well, any emotions typically right hemisphere unless it's fear. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of different approaches, and I, I haven't got time. But you know, basically any of the spiritual approaches. Um, I'm particularly interested in the ancient approaches, mostly because I think they had more awareness of the problem, more insight. So I think some of those earlier approaches are probably more effective. I mean, we've, we've, we're in an age now where there's all sorts of ideas, and I think some of them may be less effective, possibly even detrimental. So I'm more interested in ancient approaches. And they tend to fall into three camps. As I said the other day, we've got natural diet. Well, that's advanced molecular re-engineering, rebuilding the most complex thing we know. That's going to take a while, two, three years minimum. Then we've got techniques to inhibit the left. You know, the Trappist the tradition, don't speak, meditation, get the chattering voice to stop at all costs. Left hemisphere, if it's not talking, if it's not chattering away, it's like it doesn't exist. You know, so it's constantly going on and on and on and on. Then... Um, techniques to stimulate the right hemisphere so you've got you know dance music um, it can be the judicious use of plant medicines this kind of thing they stimulate stimulate the right hemisphere you start putting all these things together so really good diet really healthy diet techniques to inhibit the left techniques to stimulate the right then you start getting quite powerful results quite quickly it's you know it's very formulaic it's very rational but my intention is to make this simple so the left brain can understand and the cool thing is it gets excited about it. So, wow, that's a cool idea. But the net result is it's a left hemisphere that gets shifted out of the way, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's, does your it's, book go into a lot of those techniques? It outlines a basic framework, not a huge amount of detail. My, my current focus is diagnosis. You know, without getting a diagnosis out there, there's, there's no possibility of change. The treatments, I think, are already there. You know, but we've got to get the diagnosis. I'm going to have to stop because I think... Oh, is it, yeah, I started with All right, okay. Thank you very much. I, I can take a few more questions. Outside.